בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, שבוע טוב, חודש טוב. The uh, Shiur Bezot Hashem tonight uh, was Sunday night, Sharet Zion. We are um, continuing our Shiurim on Sunday night. The uh, last uh, month or so we've been doing a different Shiur, a different topic each week. So far so good. Baruch Hashem, until uh, further notice, maybe we'll start a series at some point. I know a few people uh, have asked me about uh, starting new series. They've suggested different Sfarim to do it, but uh, it's uh, easier said than done. To do a series on a sefer, uh, even if you have the sefer, you have to really be baki in the inyan. You have to be an expert in the uh, sefer if you're going to do a series on it, because you know people are depending on you. Even if it's a uh, one person or a thousand people or Baruch Hashem, tens of thousands of people watching the shiurim, you have to uh, know what you're do- doing before you do a series. Plus, it's a very big commitment because a lot of the things that people suggest are usually big sfarim. You're talking about a uh, multi-year commitment, especially with the way I talk. You know, a short conversation for me is 45 minutes. Uh, how you doing? 45 minutes later. Good, good. Uh, so, Bezat Hashem, today's year will be for Refua Shlema, uh, for um, Sara Bat Levana, uh, for Levana Bat Sara, for uh, Ovadia Ben Levana, Yosef Ben Levana, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Chulamit, Rabbi Sara Bat uh, Anat, uh, Chaim Ben Sara, um, also uh, for uh, Dvora Bat Mercedes, Elisheva, Chaya Bat Sara, uh, Yochevet Bat Batya, Batya Bat Sara, uh, Naomi Bat uh, Sara, and uh, all of Am Yisrael Bezat Hashem will have Refua Shlema, Refua Tanefesh, Refua Taguf. So uh, today, some of the things I wanted to talk about is really... Uh, Less alachic, like we did in the last couple of lectures, uh, and more of the uh, practical day-to-day battle that uh, each and every one of us uh, deals with, um, where if you're watching me for more than one or two lectures, by now you realize that we don't sugarcoat, we don't even know how to do it. Uh, we tell you what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said and uh, what Chazal said and uh, take it as you may. You like it, you don't like it, it's really not my responsibility. Uh, my responsibility is to give you the emet and you do what you please with it. The question is, what do you want to be? Do you want to be Yaakov or do you want to be Esav? And in the merit of this week's Parashat Toldot, where we meet both of them, we meet Esav and Yaakov, which in essence are the two powers in the world today. You have Yaakov, the tzaddikim, the people that are trying their best to do the will of Hashem. And you have Esav, which are the rest of the people that are doing everything in their power to destroy everything that Hashem wants. The question is, who do you want to be? That's the question. Now, practically speaking, most people, if you're watching me at after one, two, three, four, five lectures, and you continue watching after that, you at the very least desire to be like Yaakov. You desire to be like Sarai Menu. You desire to be like Avraham, Yitzchak. You desire to be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Nothing less. You desire to be like Miriam. You desire to be like David Melech. You want to be. You hear so many wonderful things said about these people. Why wouldn't I want to be like them? What's the problem? The problem is that we have desires also. While we desire to be like Yaakov, we also have desires like Esav. Not to be like Esav. We just desire the same stuff he does. We don't want the same verse to be written on us. It Esav Saniti. Hashem hates Esav. No one wants Hashem to write a verse in a Torah in heaven. It's uh, such and such, I hate him. Oh, you know him? Yeah, I hate him. Who wants to go up to Shamaim and says, Oh, here's that guy. Yeah, the guy, Hashem, that's the guy you hate, right? Yeah, yeah, it's him. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to go up to Shamaim and be, oh, the one that everyone's pointing on. Every single generation is going to point at him. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, all the tzaddikim. From the time of uh, the beginning all the way to today, all going to point at, oh, here's the Rasha. 
Hey, hey, it's the guy that you said you hate. Hashem, hey. You don't want that. He's the guy that destroyed your breed, Hashem. That's the guy. Yeah, it says that's the criminal. No one wants that. The embarrassment a person will have, he would want death all over again. The embarrassed a woman, embarrassment a woman that lived her life immodestly in this world will experience in Shemaim the second she arrives, she would want to die again. You can move the back, Tzadik. You can move the back. It's not the holy thing. The embarrassment she would feel just the second she arrives when every single generation from the beginning of time points at her and says, Oh, that's the criminal. She would want to die again. Such embarrassment. No one wants to be Esav. No one wants to be such a criminal. But we all have to admit we have desires like Esav. We have desires like Esav. We do. So what do we do when we want to be like Yaakov? But our desire is not so much. Yaakov, Isho Alim, he's in the tent all day learning Torah. Today a guy tells me, oh, listen, I'm in a new level. I'm on a new level now. I studied a whole hour today. I watched the movie after. I watched uh, HBO after. I watched, uh, you know, sports after. And a little bit before and sometimes during. But I did a whole hour today. I'm Yaakov, right? Uh, mini, micro, something. The Y. The U, you know, like the half of the U, maybe. People don't want to be Isho Ali where you're in the tent 18, 19 hours a day. Okay, you don't have to be. But can you do eight? No. Okay, can you do five? How about this? Why don't you do a couple of hours, but just the rest of the time, stop making Averot like Esav. How about that for a deal? That's the key. Not everyone can immediately elevate themselves to such a high level of kedusha that they could take their body and simply ignore it. Ignore all of its desires and say, no, 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 uh, food, no, later. When? Tomorrow, maybe. Physical desires, no, I need, on, on Shabbat, on Shabbat, I'll see you. On Shabbat, I'll see you. I'm learning all week. Talk to you on Shabbat. Oh, who can do that? Not many, not many. A few Baruch Hashem in the world, but not that many. I have Baruch Hashem, Tamidei Yeshiva, you know, they learn all day. They sin at night. Hashem Yerachem. They learn all day in, in, in the court, in yeshiva, everything. The, the rabbi tells them, do, 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 do. but why they call me? Because they're addicted to all the toyevot in the world. All the filth in the world are addicted. Meaning, all of the Torah that they learn all day, all of it goes to the sitra achra. All of it goes to the satan. Why? You learned all day, so it has to go somewhere. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want a Torah full of filth. So he has to give it to someone. Oh, we give it to the Satan. That's what the Zohar Kadosh says about certain sins, especially the sins of the young ones. The young generation that's addicted to Pgama Brit, women that are promiscuous, immodesty, all of the mitzvot go to the Satan. But the good news is, when they do tshuva, they can get all back and turn all of their averot into mitzvot, even more. The reality is, what's the difference between Esav and Yaakov? The difference is Rabotaya Karim is desires. They both have the same desires. Just one controls them and one does not. Now we see in this week's parasha, parasha Toldot, we meet Esav and Yaakov. Interestingly, after very little that we've learned about Yitzchak, which will, Bezat Hashem, if we have the time, we'll cover why there's so little about Yitzchak. You see, Avram Avinu, Three different parashot. Yaakov, the rest of Sefer Bereshit talks about Yaakov. Yitzchak, there's maybe, I don't know, five verses that mention his name. This is Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. It's not like Avram and, you know, Yaakov, and there's someone in between. Yitzchak, Kodesh, Kodeshim. But there's very little about Yitzchak. There's, it seems like there's even more about Esav than there is about Yitzchak. How come? But here when we first meet Esav, we see that already from the Betin, already from his mommy's belly, already he had Midot Mushchatot. He already had corrupted character traits. Already desired Davodah What does it mean, desired Davodah Well, he wanted to go uh, find Yoshke. 
That was his grandson, by the way. The, uh, there's a Mekubah that says that the uh, found, I think I told you guys, the Chidush, the uh, Esav Gilgul of Yoshke. I gave you guys the Chidush about this about a year ago. Yoshke is uh, JC, Jesus, Jesus uh, the, the fool. By the way, for anyone that takes offense for me making fun of Avodah Zarah, good, get offended. Learn Gemara, you'll see that it's a mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of Avodah Zarah. Mitzvah. Mitzvah, just like you eat kosher, just like you put on tefillin, just like you keep Shabbat, you make fun of Avodah Zarah, it's a mitzvah. Sometimes people send me mail, oh, it's not so nice that you make fun of the uh, Christians. I don't make fun of the Christians. I make fun of their beliefs. Why? To help them. Get out of their filth. So they could also be part of Chazdeu Mot Olam. You know how many Christians I got out of that filth and now they're Baruch Hashem Tzadikim? Not me, Torah. But if I told no, it's okay, everything's okay, we love you, it's okay, guess what? They get much worse. Start inviting me to churches or something. Then you guys are not going to have a shit. No, I'm kidding. Now I have to go to a church. Anyway, Rabotai, we see that Esav and Yaakov already in the beginning there is a battle. There's a battle, a very famous battle that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells their mother Rivka Vayomer Adonai La Shnei Goim Bebitnech Ushnei Leomim Memaich You have two nations in your belly. How is it? One's a Jew, one's Christian. How could it be? Same belly. No conversion. No bedin. Already inside. Both one Sadiq, one Rasha. How can it be? Chazal says that how, how, why was this question? Why did Rivka ask for this prophecy? She asked for news. What's going on here? I'm scared. I went by the Bet Midrash. Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Aleain, Yaakov is celebrating. He starts singing Akadosh Baruch Hu, we love you, everything. He's happy. He's so quiet. Like, oh, it's Bet Midrash again. But she goes past the church, Hashem Yilachem. She, uh, Esau starts dancing, ooh, ah, starts doing uh, all, the, all types of uh, Christmas carol. By the way, as a side note, just to make you guys happy, Baruch Hashem, we took a little walk on Shabbat. And you know, unfortunately, you, know, you live in America, you have Goim. And, and even in Jewish neighborhoods. Not that necessarily the goyim are always bad, just it's goyim that you want to live in a Jewish neighborhood. You also can have goyim. And the goyim also express themselves. So part of the things they do at this time of the season is uh, they put their, uh, their Xmas stuff. You know, the Santa, Shmenta, all that nonsense. Some fat guy with a suit that Coca-Cola invented. <laughs> no, that's the truth. If you look at the history, who Santa Claus is, it looks nothing like that guy, first of all. It was some guy from Christianity invented him. But the reason why he's, uh, why he's red and white is because Coca-Cola invented it. <laughs> That's the history. People don't know that they're worshipping Coca-Cola. <laughs> now, when we pass by, how do you know, Baruch Hashem, that the education of a kid is going in the right direction? When you pass by, you know, my wife and I are talking at the little babies in the, in the, in the carriages. And uh, my daughter, God bless her, she points, Ima, Ima, that's the Yetzara, that's the Yetzara. Well, pointing, what? Yetzara? Oh, look, Santa. <laughs> I said, that nah, it was worth it to come to the world just for this. It was worth it to come to the world just for this. Now, if that wasn't good enough, there was a, uh, a few uh, girls, Jewish girls, that uh, forgot half their clothes at home. They forgot, they get forgetful. So you wear like a half a skirt and a half a shirt. And they're all, you know, walking around on Shabbat. You know, sometimes with my wife, God bless her, she shows my uh, kids, uh, you know, different videos, educational videos, Torah, Aleph Bet, uh, all types of things. And use, uh, use the internet for it. And sometimes, the, you know, it has an advertisement. So my wife tells them, close your eyes, advertisement. Why? Because 99% of the time, it's filth on these advertisements. They show you half-naked women selling soap. What does the half-naked woman have to do with the soap? I have no idea. Get a car wash today, but there's a naked woman. What does it have to do with her? 
I'm getting a car wash. Everything is always filth. So my wife, God bless her, what does she do? She tells the kids, close your eyes, advertisement. That's what we do. So we keep walking. Same walk. Same walk. Walking, walking, walking. And then these girls are walking up the street. And Ovadia says, Ima, advertisement, close your eyes. Advertisement, close your eyes. Two and a half year old tzaddik. Just for that, it was worth it to come to the world. I could go to Allah and say, hey, Hashem, I did it. No, come on. Find me. Come on. Advertisement. I should call, from now on, that's what I'm calling immodesty. Advertisement. <laughs> advertisement. Watch out. Close your eyes. Ima, advertisement. So I figured I'd make you guys a little happy in the beginning. If I scare you, no. So now we see Isav and Yaakov already battling. Yaakov wants to go to the Bet Midrash, learn Torah. Isav wants to go to a place of Avodah Zarah. He wants to be Buddha, Shmuda, all those things. What does it really mean? Christianity wasn't even born yet. Buddhism, no one's even heard of it. What does it really mean he wanted to go to a place of Avodah Zarah? So, the truth is, Rabotai, we find this out, what he really wanted, shortly later. When Esav sees Yaakov, after he did what he did throughout the day, and he sees that Yaakov has a dish, chulent. He has a nice, beautiful dish of food. And he says to him, give me from this Adoma Adomaze, this red, red stuff. Give me this red, red stuff. Because I'm really tired to the point where he's almost going to die, he says. And on that, his name became Edom. He wants something Adom because the dish was red. Adom is red. And because of that, his name is Edom, which sounds like Adom. Edom sounds like Adom. So what, if you eat uh, Chulint, your name is Chulint? You eat some uh, schnitzel, your name is New Schnitzel? No, what's the real meaning here? What's the Kadosh Baruch Hu trying to tell us? He's trying to give us an answer. What did Esav really desire in the beginning when he was still in the belly of his mom? Materialism. Materializing a Kadosh Baruch Hu. He wanted an image. We say in our Torah, Kedusha, like a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, En lo guf, en lo dmuta guf. He has no body, he has no likeness of a body. The Christians, what do they say? Or they call themselves now a new revised name, Messianic Jews. Same thing as Christianity, by the way. There's nothing Jewish about Messianic Jews. Even the sign is not Jewish. What do they say? They say, no, no, uh, God is really Yoshke. God, uh, you know, made himself into a body. Unfortunately, some Jews think that their rabbi became a body also, became God also. As I showed you guys a couple of weeks ago from my recording. You see, that's what they learn in certain yeshivot in the world. That their rabbi, that was a tzaddik, unfortunately turning everything that he stood for into the opposite. They tell you that the rabbi became God. Or a piece of God, or something God, whatever the talk, whatever shtiot comes into their head. So you can't trust anyone anymore to protect you from Esav. Why? Because Esav, what does he want? He wants materialism. To materialize God, to materialize every desire, everything he wants, he wants it now. Everything she wants, she wants it today, she wants it yesterday. Why are you late? I, you should have known what I wanted before I told you. Addiction to stuff. So now, each one of us are all trying in our own ways to be like Yaakov. Why? Because we know that Yaakov's end is, Baruch Hashem, is very good. Yaakov, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, it Yaakov Afti. Yaakov, I loved him. I love Yaakov. Like he loved Avram, like he loved Yitzchak, he loved Yaakov, Yaakov from Yaakov, we all are here. All of Am Yisrael comes from Yaakov. But Esav Saneti, I hate Esav. Even though they're brothers, even though they both have the same father, even though they both have the same grandfather, everything is the same, they all grew up, they were almost identical. Until they were teenagers. So much so, that Chazal says that originally, even though the desires of Esav were terrible, he also had things that were good, to such an extent that half of the tribes, 
half of Am Yisrael's tribes were supposed to come from Esav. Six and six. But because he chose to fulfill his desires in this world, he lost his Olam Abba. He lost his Olam Azeh, he lost everything. So we want the end of Yaakov, who got all 12 tribes. We want to have a blessing written on us in Shamayim, not curses, not hatred. We want to arrive to Hashem and say, Oh, Tzadik or Tzadikah has arrived. A nice welcome. That's what we want. But we have desires. We have desires that make us, unfortunately, sometimes act like Esav. So, the question is, how do we deal with this? Now, there was a certain Rishon, a certain Chacham, lived about almost 800 years ago, after Rabbein Yonah and the Ramban. His name was the Rashba. Rabbi Shlomo ben Adiret. And his, uh, in his sefer, one of his farim, Chidushe Agadot, he writes the commentary and explanation on all of the different stories in the Gemara. All of the different Agadot that we have, like some people, they like to make fun of the Torah, even if they call themselves religious. Why? Because they don't understand what it says. They don't understand the real significance and the depth of the story. So they assume it's optional to believe this. Anytime somebody says it's optional to believe something that's in the Gemara, that only shows you one thing. That person has exercised their option not to read the Gemara. Why? Because the Gemara says, if you don't believe something that's in the Gemara, you're a kofel. You cannot be counted in the minyan even if you put yourself a title of rabbi. And unfortunately, there are certain people in the world that say it's optional to believe certain things. First, understand what's being said. Then criticize it. Then say what you want to say. See what all the chachamim before you have said. Don't think that you're such a big chacham that you could just decide that you're going to criticize all of the giants that came before you. Now, the Rashba. He gave, wrote a book, took all the Agadot that's in the uh, Shas, in the Gemara, and he gave commentary and deep explanation about each and every one of them. And uh, one of the Gdolei Ado from a little over a uh, hundred years ago, uh, Rav Yechiel Michael Feinstein, the uh, uncle of Rav Moshe Feinstein, Allah Shalom. He was also a giant in the Torah, and he would say, that learning the Rashba, learning the Rashba, strengthens your mind, makes your mind straight, makes it straight where it takes your brain to good places. This is something that is very much needed in our generation because you see that sometimes people learn Torah, but they still have thoughts of Kfirah. Many times, those thoughts of kfirah stem from two places. One, a specific sin of gilu arayot. For men, it's wasting seed. For women, it's a promiscuousness. Or even if she's immodest regularly. And the second thing is a teacher. That's a heretic himself. If you learn from a heretic, you will become a heretic. Why? Because we do not have such mental prowess and such holiness that we can decipher the holiness within the heresy that he says. That's what the Gemara in Moed Katan says. If your teacher, if your rabbi has midot and character traits like a Malach Hashem, he's trying to be a Malach Hashem, he's trying to be a good guy. Learn from him. But if he has filthy character traits, he's arrogant, he does all types of things. He makes fun of the Chachami, makes fun of the Torah, makes fun of all types of things that are holy. Not allowed to learn from him. Not that you shouldn't. Not allowed. On the first one, it says you should learn from him. You should learn from the guy that's trying to be a tzaddik like Malach Hashem. The second one says not allowed. Now you shouldn't. Meaning it's an avira. Meaning it's a sin to learn from someone that's a heretic. Unfortunately, today, Rabbi Karim, somebody asked me just a few days ago, started a new uh, website in the UK 
uh, torahsecrets.uk.com from some rabbis. But he asked me, can you recommend some rabbis that I could put on the channel? I gave him a few names. And uh, he says, you have any more? I said, I'm sorry, I can't vouch for anybody else. I don't know, I mean, there might be other people. I personally can't vouch for anybody else in the English-speaking world. There's so many. Yeah, but today, the number is great. But as far as someone that I could say, you know what? I'll put my ulama ba on it. If this guy says kosher Torah, I can't tell you this one is good. That one, is, I know the ones that are bad. I know a few that are good, but not many. Not many. Why? Because unfortunately, it's only a matter of time before you see some of these people taking a Torah, crumbling it into like a toilet paper, and deciding to give their own opinion instead. Why? For the comfort of the tzibu, the comfort of the crowd. Whatever is popular with this kila, we'll say here. Whatever is popular with that kila, we'll say there. If they speak to Haredim, they'll talk about stuff like that. They speak to modern Orthodox, they'll talk stuff like that. And they change. You know, like Plato. Someone like that, not allowed to learn from him. So, now the Rashba, he's one of the Rishonim, one of the giants that we had, that his Torah strains your mind, meaning that it literally, once you learn it, you literally understand how you're supposed to think. How you're supposed to think about everything. And he has a beautiful chidush. Says in the Gemara Masechet Brachot, page 50a, it says that Rabbi Meir Balanes, anytime it says Rabbi Meir in the Gemara, it's Rabbi Meir Balanes. Just like anytime it says Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon, Bar Yochai. Now, even though Rabbi Meir has several names, and his name was really not Rabbi Meir. The reason why he's called Rabbi Meir is because Meir means he brought light. What light? What light? Brought light to the world of his Torah, of his holiness. Now, the Rashba says that, Rabbi Meir says, that at the time of Yam Suf, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu split the ocean, we hear, we see from a Torah, the Rin Torah, that it says something that we say regularly. As Yashir Moshe, the Shira. Az Yashir Moshe, all of Ami says started singing with Moshe Rabbeinu about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, sanctifying him. And then Rabbi Meir Baranes says, when it says the verse, Ze li ve'anveu, this is my God and I will glorify him. Who said this? Who sang this? Who who's doing, who's doing this? Rabbi Meir Baranes says, the little babies inside their mommy's bellies, they were singing it. Says that the belly became transparent. So women that got pregnant already were at the time of, uh, of of Egypt. That means that they had six of them. Six little babies. Oh, every woman has a belly. The belly becomes transparent. You get six, six little munchkins pointing at the chamaim. Zeli vanvu. This is my God, and I will glorify Him. Imagine. So Rabbi Meir says, the babies inside their mommy's bellies were the ones that were singing the Shira Le Hashem. Where do we learn this from? We learn this from the book of Psalms. David Melech writes a psalm in uh, chapter 68, verse 27. He says, "Bemakhelot b'chu Elohim, Hashem mimkor Yisrael, mimkor Yisrael." In congregations, bless God, my Lord, all who descend from Israel. So the Rashba says, "What does this verse have to do with uh, with this?" It says this is the verse that talks about. The kids, the babies, pointing. They were descendants of Am Israel. They were pointing and uh, saying, this is God and I will glorify Him. But how do we know He's talking about the babies? It says, Mimekor, Makor, the Gemara in Masechet Nida, says Makor is another name for the private part of a woman. So, Makor Mekoma Tmea. Tameh. 
So the Gemara Masech Nida says that a makor is tame, meaning it becomes tame, which is the part of the uh, of the female body. Once a month, she has a time of the month, it becomes tame, and the Gemara goes into extent and details how the tumah of the nida is more impure than anything else in the world. Not that it makes the woman a bad woman, not that chash v'shalom it makes her evil chash v'shalom. In essence, this is a time of the month, the woman is forbidden to her husband. If she has a friend, her girlfriend, and her girlfriend, every time she sees her, she wants to give her a hug, no problem. Her husband, on the other hand, is not allowed to touch her. Why? She's tamit to him. She's also never allowed to touch any other guy, but the point being is that uh, unless it's her father, and, they, and uh, some say, yeah, what about her brother? What about her brother? If she's a grown woman, the Rambam says, if she's a grown woman and she touch, touches or hugs her grown brother, only stupid people do this. That's what the Rambam, that's the actual language of the Rambam. Meaning, it's not a sin like it is some strange man, because that's uh, Shem Yerachem, that's completely forbidden. You see sometimes weddings, bar mitzvot, all types of things, or at the Bet Knesset sometimes, you see women that are married hugging their uh, next door neighbor or their uh, different people. Ah, ah, how are you? How are you? How are you? Uh, Kadosh Baruch says, I'm out of here. This is a place of Gilu Arayot. Where is she hugging? You know, Bet Knesset, she, they're good friends. What good friends? She's an Eshet Ish. She's a married woman. She's not allowed to touch any other man. Not allowed to touch any other man. Even her husband, the Shulchan Aruch says, she's not allowed to touch him in public. In your private home, no problem. As long as she's not nida. In public, you're not even allowed to hold your, your husband's hand. That's what Shukhan Aruch says. But unfortunately, people are confused in this generation. Why? They've modernized the Torah so much that you see many times rabbis. Rabbis of Keilot have their profile pictures on their websites or Facebook pages with their wives and kids hugging their wife. You know, they want to show the, the people that they love their wife. What they're not, not understanding is they're showing the people also, if the people understood, they're showing that they hate Hashem. Why? They don't follow His law. They may not mean that, but that's what it shows. You can't tell your wife, honey, I love you, and you have a girlfriend on the side. You can't. It's not, you could say, I love you until you turn blue in the face. If you have a girlfriend on the side, you don't love anybody other than yourself. So, now, Aisha Nida, an impure woman, she has a time of the month, she's forbidden to her husband. By default, any woman that's not married, she's not allowed to go to the mikveh, which means she is always Nida. So all of the guys that have girlfriends, if you want Gan Eden, leave your girlfriend or get married immediately. You want Gainom, continue and ignoring me. Continue ignoring the Torah. Why? Every time you touch your girlfriend, whether it's touching hands or Hashem Yachem, even worse, every single time, you are building yourself a nice penthouse in Geinom. This is what, this is what Torah says. Why? Because it's Isur Nida. Isur Nida is one of the worst crimes in the Torah. To such an extent that the Arizal says, if you violated Isur Nida one time, one time you were with the Nida, one time, one time, not uh, every week, every day. Some guys, they find a new, girl, new wife every day. They think they're having a good time. One time you touch the nida, you have to fast 82 times. Pretty much kill yourself. 82 times, one time. Now, obviously, since our generation is very, very weak, no one can fast 82 times unless they're an extremely holy person and they divide it over a period of time. What do you do if you had... You're Baal Tshuva, or even if you're not, you're now a Baal Tshuva, whatever you are, and you did it a bunch of times. What do you do? First of all, stop. Don't tell me I love her, I don't love her. Don't tell me anything. Tell Hashem. Second, you have to stop the relationship. Two, you have to make sure you never do it again. Don't put yourself in a scenario where it's going to happen again. Third, you have to start doing serious tshuva by learning about the topic that's going to give you strength to continue not doing it again. And fourth of all, you have to help other people. Other people discover the truth about Isur Nida. Even if you're married and you never knew that you're not allowed to be with your wife whenever you feel like it, 
or your wife didn't feel like going to the mikveh, but now, Baruch Hashem, you learn and she goes to the mikveh, and you still have to do tshuva. You have to educate people to let them know. How do you educate them if you're not an educator? You give them the shiul, you fast forward it to them, you press share, Bezat Hashem, they do tshuva, it helps you. Last but not least, you have to do tikkun. What's a tikkun? Just like tikkun of wasting seed, you have to, each time a person wasted seed, it's 84 fast. Each time he touched and he died, it's 82 fast. Each time. So now people can't fast that many times. What do they do? They do it with money. So the Chachamim say you have to take money. How much money it costs you to eat per day? How much money it costs you to eat per day? Let's say, for example, it costs you, I don't know, uh, $10 a day to eat. Unless you eat out every day, then it's going to cost you $100 a day. No wonder nobody has any money yet. But the point is, if you eat at home, it costs you, let's say, $10 a day to eat. That means for each time you sinned, you have to fast 82 times. So that is 82 times 10. $820. You have to donate to Zikuya Rabim, to Kiruv, to help people do tshuva, because that helps you with both aspects. Now, what if you, what if you did it a thousand times, and you don't have uh, eight, $8 million? No problem. Kadosh Baruch knows you don't have $8 million. What do you have? You have $82, you have $800, you have $8,000. Now, what do you have? You have something? Everybody has something. Start with something. And then make it on a regular basis, little by little, you're going to start doing it. Even if it's literally $8 or $8,000, whatever you have, start donating for this specific purpose on a regular basis. Every single month, every time you get a paycheck. Why? You have to fix it. You don't want to show up to Shemayin with these tikkunim undone. Some people go to the extent where they literally go to Yerushalayim, to the uh, neighborhood of the Bukharim. There's a uh, place over there full of Mekubalim. They do specific tikkunim for people. They still donate to Kiruv and other places. They don't have to necessarily donate to the Mekubalim. But the point being is that people that understand are very, very scared of showing up to Shemaim with these sins on their hands. Needless to say, Isu Nida is no different than the Isu of wasting seed. Many times it's both. Many times he was with the girl and he wasted seed. So it's both he has to fix. Point being, Rabotai, fixing, doing tshuva is not cheap. And it's not easy. But HaKadosh Baruch is not expecting you to do it overnight. He's simply expecting you to start. Do something. Do something on a regular basis. So now, the word meko means the area of the woman. Now the Rashba says, now that we know that this verse that's talking about the babies, pointing at HaKadosh Baruch and saying, this is Hashem and I'll glorify Him, we have a miracle to explain. What's the miracle? It's a miracle that most people either don't know about or don't discuss. What miracle? The Rashba says it's well known that pregnant women have, can have miscarriages if they see scary things or they have too much anxiety. Yet, despite the fact that the Am Israel had the Egyptians chasing them to kill them from behind. The ocean in front of them and a desert on the right and left full of anacondas and scorpions the size of humans. No one had. No one out of Am Israel had a miscarriage. If you're going to talk about anxiety, what, you're late for rent? You're late in your mortgage? Is that bigger anxiety than being where Am Yisrael was before the Yam Suf split? Even after the ocean split, how do you know it's not going to collapse on top of you? Even after it split. You go walk in the middle of the ocean and, oh yeah, it's not going to split. I'm the last one. Maybe it's going to be a mistake. It's, I'm going to be the last one. It's going to fall on me. Maybe the Egyptians are going to catch up. What ended up happening is that the whole Yam Suf was like a uh, shape of a rainbow. You went one end and you came back to the same end. So many of Ami said didn't know what happened to the Egyptians. They thought that it's a trap. That's so much anxiety. You're carrying six little tinokim, tinokot, in your belly and you're not, you're not anxious. So the Rashba says, look at this miracle. This place naturally Naturally, with the nature that a Kadosh Baruch Hu instilled into the world, 
Yam Suf was supposed to turn into a Bet Kvarot, a cemetery. A cemetery, a Shem Yachem of babies. That's how scary it was, the whole thing. But yet, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu miraculously strengthened the hearts of the women, making this one of the biggest miracles that's not discussed. So now the question the Rashba says, so who said the Shira? Who's the one that actually said the song? The babies. The babies were the one that was singing. Why were the babies ones that were singing? Because they were the ones that were singing, praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu for not killing them. They were praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Because right now, any moment, any moment, she gets stressed out, we're finished, guys. One guy tells his five brothers and sisters, hey, guys, listen, everything's on the line right now. Everything's on the line. I'm nervous. The other one says, I'm also nervous. They speak Hebrew, by the way. Yeah, nervous, nervous. Everybody's nervous. Why? Any minute, we're out of here. But miraculously, they see everything is good. They see a Kadosh Baruch Hu in the heavens, opens the heavens. They point, everything is good. They start singing to Kadosh Baruch Hu. You guys were all there. You just don't remember. Bad memories. Now, so what's the meaning of the end of the verse itself? When it says Mekor Israel, now that we know that Mekor has the meaning, the hidden meaning of referring to the babies, but what's the pshat? Meaning, it still says the basic meaning of the verse says Mekor Israel, meaning the descend, the descendants of Israel. So the Rashba gives the chidush that all of this preparation was for. He says Mekor Israel, descendants of Israel means this the one of two options available one that the only ones the only babies that were saved and not miscarried were descendants of Am Yisrael but there were some miscarriages there who? the Erev Rav the Erev Rav the wicked ones, those that came from Egypt, wanted to fake conversions. They, there was, there could have been some miscarriages from them. Why? Because they're not descendants of Am Yisrael. But he says there is an option two. Option two is due to the merits of Mekor Israel, of the descendants of Am Yisrael, even the Erev Rav got protected, and there was no miscarriages even for them. Explaining. Two things. One, there is a significant difference between Mekor Israel Yaakov and Erev Rav Esav. You have to know this. In your mind, you have to make this huge difference in your mind. Why? Because you may have a relative that you care for that's potentially Erev Rav. You may have a father, a mother, a sister, a son, a daughter. A husband, a wife, that's Erev Rav. Because with all of the stuff that's happened over the generations, HaKadosh Baruch Hu spread Erev Rav even among the Jews. You don't know who's Erev Rav just by looking at them. You only know by what comes out of their mouth and how they behave. So first thing the Rashba teaches us is that you have to make a distinguishing difference in your own mind. There is a difference. There's a Yaakov, there's a kosher Jew and there's Erev Rav. Even if that Erev Rav is your cousin. No, I love him though. He's a good guy. So what? He doesn't keep Shabbat. So what? He has a website against rabbis. But he's a good guy. He lent me a few dollars last month. He has the qualifications of Erev Rav. And don't go there and tell him, yo, by the way, you're Erev Rav. But he has the qualifications. But don't lose hope. Why? Because of the second part. Second part is that the power of Yaakov can even save the Erev Rav. The power of the Kedusha of Yaakov, if implemented the right way, 
could even save the Erev Rav. Your cousin, your uncle, your father, your mother, your nephew, your son, your daughter, your wife, that's right now hates Torah and everything about it. She has a whole web page against me. She has a web page. I hate your own Ruvid. Why? Because he teaches Torah. Good. No problem. You can still save even her. No problem. You could save her. Will you? That's a different story. It's possible to save them. Hard, but possible. I wouldn't necessarily invest all my energy on trying to save Erev Rav because there's plenty of people that are Yaakov that just don't know it that you could save easily. But nonetheless, don't lose hope. Don't get offended. Don't get to a point where, oh, I'm going to give... No, no. It's okay. Every one of us is related to some Erev Rav. Even if they're not Mamash Erev Rav, they act like it. So now, Rabbi Fahim asks, each one of us has to ask ourselves a question. It's easy to look in the mirror and say, I'm uh, Mekor Israel. I'm Yaakov. I'm Yaakov, yeah, that, that guy, that guy who's sitting next to me, that guy on the bus, that guy in the hand works next to me. He's Erev Rav. He's Erev Rav. I'm Mekor Israel. Every one of us really looks at ourselves. Ah, we're, uh, we're Mekor Israel. we're Yaakov. Everybody else is Erev Rav. Question is, who do we act more like? If we're looking to fulfill every single desire and every whim that we have, that's what Esav, their grandfather, was doing. If every time there's food being offered, you go even if you're not hungry, that's a little bit of Esavish. If somebody tells you, listen, this is Shul Torah. You want to come? Are they serving food there? No. Oh, no, I'm busy. I'm busy. No, it's Shul Torah. Were they offering food? Yeah, maybe they have some uh, cupcakes. No, nah, you know, I had some cupcakes. No. Oh, it's Shul Torah. Oh, there's food? Yeah, they're giving Chinese food. Okay, I'm coming. I'm coming. Yeah, but didn't you just eat? Yeah, yeah, but you know, a little Chinese food that can never hurt. A little Chinese food can never hurt. That's a little bit of Erev Abish. Not saying don't come. I'm just saying if you only come because of the food, eh, it's a little Erev Rav. A little bit. It's like Midat Erev Rav. It's like the, you know, it's like sometimes you have like this, you know, get a car wash or something and the guy missed the spot but that's the main spot you brought the whole car to fix, but he missed it. That's it. It's like, yeah, you washed the car, it's good, but you missed the whole thing. The whole point of why I'm paying you $20 is for that one spot. Come on, no. That's the point. If you're only coming for the food, okay, come, it's okay, but So now, Rabutai Karim, sometimes we don't know that we act like it. For example, in my shul in California, some time ago, a few people in the crowd found it uh, funny. And since I don't have many jokes, I remember my jokes. I said, Sometimes a person, you know, he likes a song that says Hashem. Well, it makes him feel holy. So there's a few songs that secular singers sing. One famous one is Mishema Amin Lo Whoever has Emunah is never scared. Another one is Akados Ba'uchu, We Love You. And sometimes you see people singing these songs, Mishema Amin Lo You know, and they're jamming in their car while they're driving on Shabbat. Yeah, he just finished Kiddush. He's all pumped up with Hashem. Yeah, Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach. He's got, uh, you know, he's got Nisim Black on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you driving on Shabbat? He forgot that Shabbat, you're not supposed to drive. He forgot that you're actually seeing Hashem Melech while you're spitting on him in the face. While you're stepping on him, while you're stepping on his Torah and burning it to pieces, with every single time that you like to turn on the ignition, every single time you press the pedal, 
you're burning Hashem's Torah every single time you press the pedal, anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 times. Now, if you ask any Jew, even if the Jew doesn't like the Torah, even if he's a lefty liberal, but still somewhat normal, which is kind of hard to find, but nonetheless exists, even if she's a feminist, even if she's one of these Anshea Kotel, you tell her, listen, ma'am, here's a Sefer Torah, $100,000, do me a favor, burn it for me. Almost, you're ne- almost never going to find a Jew to do this. I say almost because there's, unfortunately, some surprises. But nonetheless, it's hard to find a Jew that's willing to burn a Torah. Even during the Holocaust, the stories, it was, uh, one particular guy was a complete, complete heretic. They asked him to burn a Torah, he said, no, I'm not burning a Torah. The Nazis asked him to burn a Torah, do his uh, business on top of the Torah, he says, no. He says, we're going to kill you, he says, kill me, and they killed him. During his life, he didn't keep a single mitzvah. Married a goya, worshipped idols, did everything possible. During the Holocaust, said to save your life. Do your business on top of this uh, on top of this Torah? No. Burn this Torah? No. They killed him. Same thing happened at the Bet HaMikdash. One Rasha Merushah in the Gemara, it says, made every sin under the sun. Titus asked him to do certain things for, for him uh, against the Torah. He wasn't willing to do it. He killed him to pieces. Cut him to pieces like steak. He was, he was willing to do it when he was, before this whole thing. But when he, to save his life, he wasn't willing to do it. Why? Because we don't think that when we drive on Shabbat or when we go with a married woman that's not our wife or when we eat non-kosher or when we go with a girlfriend without marriage, or waste seed, or even forget to do tefillin for like a year straight. You know, forget. You forgot to do tefillin for a year straight. Or you forget half your dress at home. You only wear the mini part at the bottom. Or you walk around without sleeves, without arms, nothing. As a woman, you forgot to do the mitzvot. You're burning the Torah. You're burning the Torah. A woman tells me today, listen, I have a problem. What's the problem? We grew up in an uh, orthodox home. Everything is good. But my uh, daughter now, she's in her 20s. She, uh, she has a non-Jewish boyfriend. Orthodox home. Everybody's religious. But the girl is, uh, wants to marry uh, Yoshke. She wants to marry Mustafa. How could this be? In the same message... Says, yeah, you know, the reason why she didn't really care is because she was really agnostic. In so many words, she's atheist or close to it. That's the truth. How orthodox is she if she doesn't follow the Torah mitzvot? We don't think that violating the Torah is burning it. That's why sometimes you'll see a precious Jewish neshama praying on Shabbat while he's driving on Shabbat. Saying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I love you, while he's violating Shabbat, while he's violating every, every mitzvah in the Torah. Because we don't have the connection between the two has been damaged. By what? By Esav's desires. We have a desire to go to a nightclub so we can meet someone that can fulfill our animalistic behavior. So that desire, we're so enamored by it, we're so addicted to it, that we forget that there's a connection between Hashem and Shabbat. We forget there's a connection between marriage and being with somebody. We forget that desire that Esav lost his Olam Aban is what's ruining ours. So that's why even though sometimes you're not from Zera Amalek, you're not from Esav, you're Yaakov. You, we act like Esav. Now, Am Yisrael At the time of the ocean, really the ocean has a malach, has an angel. And the angel came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said, uh, I don't want to split the ocean for these people. I don't want to split them. Why should I split it for them? Why? Because they... What? 
because they're descendants of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they have nothing to do with them. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were tzaddikim. These people, the Midrash says, some of the people brought their Avodah Zarah to the ocean. They crossed the ocean with the Avodah Zarah in the bags. They had statues in the bags. So the angel goes to Hashem and says, Elo of the Avodah Zarah, Ve'elo of the Avodah Zarah. The, the, these Am Yisrael, these Bnei Yisrael are worshipping idols. Look, they have in their bags, idols. And the Egyptians that are chasing to kill them also worship idols. So why should I split for them and uh, drown the others? It's not fair. So truly, out of everybody, there wasn't many tzaddikim. There wasn't many tzaddikim yet. Later on, they'll become tzaddikim. But truly, there was only a few. A few people that were so righteous that they had confidence in the Kadosh Baruch Hu, that they wanted the Torah, they wanted to fulfill the mitzvot, and they had trust in Hashem to no extent. They had Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron Cohen, Miriam, all you know the prophets. You had Yeshua ben Nun, Kalev ben Yefuneh. You had Nachshon ben Aminadav jumped into the ocean first. You had a few, but not many. So who did the ocean split for? You can't say it split just for those handful of people. Maybe, oh, you had Shevet Levi. Okay, so you have, let's say, 20, 30,000 people. But you have millions there. You have millions of people. Who... Did the ocean split for? So the Rashba goes into this whole miracle. He says, the Gemara Masechet Nida, page 30, says that there's an angel teaching every baby the entire Torah. But to such an extent, while he's in the belly, while she's in the belly for nine months, the angel teaches them Torah that's far beyond what their body is going to be able to handle once they leave. He gives them abilities they will not have normally once they leave. For example, a baby can see from one end of the world of the, to the other end of the world. If their father went on a trip to some other country, he can see him. No problem. He doesn't need a phone, doesn't need Skype, nothing. Abba, you better remember you need to bring him a present. That's what he's saying. He knows what's going on. A lot of things that the angel gives the abilities of the baby, a human being that's after, cannot do. But in addition to that, he teaches them an immense amount of Torah, the entire Torah. So although there was Moshe, Aaron, the tribe of Levi, Nachshon ben Eminadav, Yeshua ben Nun, Kalev, Miriam, a few others that were, uh, that had bitachon in Hashem, the ones that had the most amount of bitachon were the babies. Because they literally were learning the Torah and seeing Hashem live. So although Hashem said that based on nature, the Teva, a Teva is another name for God. Hateva, numerical value, 86. Elohim, numerical value, 86. A Teva, the nature, is just another way Hashem disguises His own behavior. So although to the nature that Hashem instilled into the world, they shouldn't have been able to keep the pregnancy, the women shouldn't have been able to keep the pregnancy, the bitachon that the babies had while they were inside them learning the Torah, singing, Hashem, singing to Hashem was so high that it was impossible for Hashem to let anything hurt any of them. Hence the reason why He split the ocean for them. So now, the Rashba asks a question. What about the babies of the Erev Rav? If they were saved, not the ones that died. Let's say the ones that saved. We go with the argument that they were saved due to the merit of Bnei Israel, Mekor Israel. What about the babies of Erev Rav? They uh, were going to turn into being the Shaim. So the Rashba says, Mishoresh Nachash Yatsa Tzefa. It says that the uh, 
from a snake, from the root of a snake came the viper. From here we learn that these babies grew into the ones that torture us to this day. We saved them, but there was a few of them that didn't do tshuva, more than a few. Until this day, they're torturing us. Until this day, they're being born. How are they being born? A person who doesn't ensure that his home is full of Kedusha and Tara, the Rashba says these Reshaim, these vipers, will come from him. Rachman al Meaning that they're already evil while they're in the belly of their mother. We learn this from Esav and Yaakov. Esav, although he had traits to do great things, he already had evil traits from the beginning. Now, the Orach Haim HaKadosh elaborates on this. What does it mean if they don't act with Kedusha and Tara? If they don't learn Torah, they don't do mitzvot. If the father doesn't learn Torah, don't be surprised if your uh, son wants to be a uh, football player. If the father doesn't watch his breed, don't be surprised if your uh, daughter wants to marry Yoshke. If the mother doesn't keep Tarat Mishpacha, don't expect anything out of this kid other than bad. Why? Because that's what our Torah says. And that's what the Orach Haim says. In Parashat Tazriya, the Orach Haim says, all of the behavior and holiness of a child will stem from the Kedusha of the parents during the act itself. How they behave during the time that they're intimate. Don't complain if your 17, 18 year old kid has no interest whatsoever in Moshe Rabbeinu. But he could tell you everything about Messi and Ronaldo. He could tell you everything about the salary cap of the NBA, the NFL, and the MLB. He could tell you everything about every sport. He could tell you who won the last contest on some singing, uh, singing uh, contest. He could tell you everything about that stuff. But you tell him, listen, what about Shabbat, Mitzvot? Esav, Yaakov, any of that stuff, no interest whatsoever. Why? Because that means you have something to do with it as a parent. Where do we learn it from? From the root of the snake comes the viper. You're the snake. That's what Orach Haim says. You're responsible for it. Doesn't mean it's permanent. Doesn't mean that you can't do anything about it. But don't blame God for it. You did something. Now, Masechet Kalara Bati in Perik Aleph says that there are certain people that are considered like Mamzerim. Mamzer is someone that comes from a forbidden relationship between a uh, man and somebody else's wife, an Eshet Ish. The son from there is a Mamzer. A Mamzer is forbidden to marry a normal Jew. He's only allowed to marry another Mamzer or a convert. Not to say that the convert Shalom, is lesser than a normal Jew, but that the convert could ask, actually rescue this mamzer from eternal, of eternity of being a mamzer. He's a mamzer. His kids are going to be mamzerim. That's like his descendants way out of being a mamzer. But they cannot go to a normal Jew. Many times people would know who they were and what they were in the previous uh, previous generation. There used to be a book, a sefer that every community had, where you came from, who's your father, who's your mother. So if there was a mamzer, they knew that you're not allowed to marry certain people. We lost this sefer orachim of every generation. We lost it. So now we're forcing Hashem's hand. We're forcing Hashem's hand to do His will in order to eliminate this. Sometimes you see strange deaths in the world. Sometimes that's the reason. I know firsthand a story. Someone told me that he discovered later in his life that he himself was a product of incest. He himself was a product of incest. His mother had intimacy with her brother. Now she didn't know he was her brother though. The mistake was really done by her mother. Anyway, long story short, 
she fell in love with who with her brother who she didn't know was her brother and one of them coming is came up this guy now this guy already found out when he was already older he's married he's had kids he had a kid what are you gonna do I saw this firsthand. I'm telling you, it was one of the scariest stories I've ever seen in my life. I talked to him once in a while, and uh, his pride and joy was his son. His whole life, his pride and joy was his son. His son had a uh, kid. He was so happy. Huh, huh? One day, he sends me a message, crying, hysterical. What happened? He said, we don't know what happened yet. All I know is my son decided to take his little baby son, his son's a grown man, took his baby son, I think it was maybe six months old or a year old, to the store with him, put him in a baby seat, turned on the car, the car exploded, and they both died. He wasn't a mobster, he wasn't connected to any gang, or any drug dealing, or nothing. To this day, no one can explain why the car exploded. I can explain it by telling you that Hashem didn't want to see in the world. It's very sad, but that's Yad Hashem. Yad Hashem. Sad, but it's a reality. Why? As long as he continues lineage, he's continuing the original sin. Intentional or unintentional, he's irrelevant. So the Chazal says here in Masechet Kala Rabati, in Perik Aleph, that there are certain people that are considered like Mamzerim. They're not Mamzerim Mamash, but they have the character traits of the mamzer. And one of them, I'll give you just a couple examples. I'm not going to go through all ten. Two examples. One is a child of Anida. A child born from his mother when she was with her with a, uh, with a husband, but she didn't go to the mikveh. She wasn't pure. She either never went to the mikveh, or they uh, pretty much decided that this mom were not doing it and they were intimate and a child was born from that. She was Nida. Kabbalah says, this is like a mamzer. This kid is going to be born with the worst character traits in the world. He's going to be a chutzpan. He's going to be this. He's going to be a lot of bad things. It's going to be very, very difficult for this kid to get close to the Torah. He's going to have a certain disgust to the Torah. Ununderstandable. Like, he doesn't know why he doesn't like it. No one knows why he doesn't like it. Because everybody else is, let's say, religious. He doesn't know why he doesn't like it. She doesn't know why she doesn't like it. Second example is that the Gemara says, that's like a mamzer, not an actual mamzer, is if the husband or the wife, with, while they were intimate with each other, they were thinking about somebody else. Hashem Yachem. In today's world, these are normal things. Sometimes they go to marriage counselors and tell them, listen, what? Your intimate life is, uh, is not good? Why don't you put on a video and look at all the disgusting filth in the world while you're together. Get yourself uh, you know, more excited about each other while you're thinking about some filthy person. This Rabotai is the filth of filth. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, this is like a mamzer. Now, the Zohar Kadosh says that a child that comes from a nida, a child that comes like this, is a child that's going to be literally as if he's, the power of the Satan brought him to the world. He's going to have a lot of midot mushchatot, a lot of bad character traits that he can overcome, she can overcome, but they're going to be very difficult, much more difficult than the norm. The kid has never been with anybody in his life. He's 17 years old, but he wants to be with a guy. Where do you guys think this comes from? She's never been with a man in her life. She's 18 years old, but she declares herself a lesbian. Why? Why do you have this rotten ideology in your head that you don't want to be, you've never been with a man. All right, tell me, listen, I've been with somebody and I didn't like it. I'm disgusted. Okay, no, okay, so let's say. Let's give that argument some, uh, some value. Something bad happened to her, Hashem Yachem, a rape, or something like, okay, I can understand, you have trauma. But today, Rabotai, we have literally people, 
A woman called me a month and a half ago, tells me our 28-year-old daughter wants to be a man. We don't know why. I told her how many men has she been with. She goes, never with anybody. There's something wrong. There's something wrong in the water here. Something happened when? Originally. 29 years ago. Something went wrong. Now, it's a very important question though. Now, a lot of people that are from, or a lot of people that are Baal Tshuva, if they're smart, they're going to think about something right now and they're going to start getting worried about what I just said. Why? Two reasons. If you're Baal Tshuva, there's a very, very high likelihood that your parents did not go to the mikveh. Your mom did not go to the mikveh if you're Baal Tshuva. Why? She didn't even keep Shabbat. You think she went to the mikveh? It's very rare. Especially in the exile. Worse yet, as I told you guys recently, there was a study done by an institution in America. In 2017, nearly half, nearly half of the women that call themselves modern orthodox, which is like religious with style or something, religious with a Ferrari, Half of them, 48% to be exact, admitted that they're not so careful with Nida. Meaning if they skip a month or two or three or nine, eh, no big deal. More than half of that half said they don't go to the mikveh at all. Meaning they call themselves religious because they cook chulin for Shabbat. They may even keep Shabbat to the best of their ability. But mikveh, nothing. These are the orthodox Modern Orthodox, to be exact. Modern Orthodox, nearly half of the children are coming from Nida. Which the Zohar Kadosh says, you have a serious problem because the power that kid's getting from the Satan himself. So now you have a problem. Why? All the Baal Tshuva, what? We're all uh, now uh, of Koch of Satan? All of the modern Orthodox, what? They're all from the Satan? Well, what's going on? So they asked this question to the Chazonish. Chazonish, Gdol Olam. They asked him. There are many Baal Tshuva in this generation, they told him. That did Tshuva after they had kids. Which means that their kids are Bnei Nida. Their kids came from Nida. They didn't know, they didn't care, a mix of both, whatever it is. Bottom line is, she's got three, four, five, six kids. Not a single one of them went to, she went to the mikveh beforehand. Or one out of the five. Whatever the case is. What do we do with these people? Should we stay away from them? They asked the Chazonish, should we stay away from them? Chazonish gives an answer worth a million dollars a month. We take payments though. He says the following. He says, check the children's behavior. Check the children's midot. If they have good midot, they're generous, they're nice, they're, 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 they, they're not anti-Torah. If they have good midot, that means that the Kedusha, the power of the Kedusha, of the Tshuva that they made, has destroyed the Tuma of Nida. The tshuva that the parents did, or the child did, is so powerful, it destroyed the most powerful power on the world, which is Nida. So that already, Rabutai, gives every single one of us a get-out-of-jail-free card regardless of where you started whether it's Amalek or it's Yaakov, or you don't even know. The power of Tshuva can destroy all Tuma. Now, but here it gives us an explanation that because of our addiction to desires, to fulfill our animalistic desires, this is leading many people to have strange desires. She suddenly wants to be with a woman. He suddenly wants to be with a man. Suddenly they don't want to be married at all. Suddenly they, uh, they want to have, you know, do all types of weird things. These weird things are coming from somewhere. 
Now, one of the uh, former Rishon Lezion, Arab Shlomo Amar, he is uh, currently the head rabbi of Yerushalayim. One of the Gdolei Ado, he recently had a shiur. And he said in the shiur that the Or Chaim HaKadosh says that before the Mashiach comes, Am Yisrael will fall into the 50th level of Tum'ah. The worst possible level. Before we got Matan Torah, we had so much idolatry and so many sins and everything that we did, we got to the 49th level of Tum'ah, 49th level of impurity, that had we made one more sin in Egypt, Hashem would have had to destroy the world. Because if we reach the 50th level, there's no recovery from that. But the Or Chaim says that before Mashiach comes, we will get to the 50th level. But the only reason Hashem will allow the 50th level is because now we have the Torah, whereas in, in uh, Egypt we did not have the Torah, and now we can recover from it through the power of the Torah. But needless to say, we will get to a level much worse than they did in Egypt. Much worse than just the idolatry and the harlotry and all of that stuff. So, Arav Amal says, I didn't know what the 50th level of Tumah is until I started seeing what's happening in the world with all of this homosexuality and filth in the world. He says that he's been getting questions from people for decades. He's an older person. Decades he's been getting questions from people. All types of strange questions. All types of difficult questions about murderers, rapists, pedophiles. You know, all types of things. But he says what happened to him last week is he got a question that sh- is still shaking him up. He couldn't sleep the whole night because of this question. And he knows we are in a 50th level. We're in a 50th level. Why? He says a rabbi calls him and tells him he has a complication. One of the people in the kila, Orthodox Jew, religious, Haridi. Not Esav, Haridi. But this husband, this guy, has a problem. What's a problem? Although he's Haridi, although his wife is Haridi, they're religious, they're from, their daughter decided she wants to marry a woman. She's religious, but she wants to marry a woman. If that's not bad enough, because it's not the first story. We had this in Sodom and Gomorrah. What made this question shake one of the G'dolei Adol last week? He says, the question is, the father says, I'm not going to the wedding. I'm no way in the world. Moche, he's a rebuke. No way, I'm going to stand for the Torah. The wife, the wife of this Orthodox guy says, if you don't come to our daughter's wedding, I'm divorcing you. You don't come to our daughter's homosexual wedding, I'm divorcing you. And the question is, he comes to the rabbi, he says, do I uh, destroy Shalom Bayit for this? The answer is, of course, you destroy all Shalom Bayit. If she wants to go marry some, uh, some animal and uh, the, the, the wife wants to be an animal and go to this party, they could be animals together. She's not a wife, she's an animal. She wants to go to a homosexual party, Shem Yachem, what is this? We take the Torah, put it in the garbage with such behavior. We're going to manipulate it whenever you feel like it. Now, Shlomo Amal says the following. He says that Rabbeinu Yitzchak Arama, the Baal Akeda, he says that Avera Achikala Shatzibu Matir Chamura Elef Pe'amim he says, when the community suddenly makes the smallest sin in the smallest sin in the Torah, pick whatever you think is small. Smallest sin in the Torah allowed. Let's say, for example, I'll just give you hypothetically speaking, uh, uh, at the end of you eating a uh, uh, bread. You have to put my machunim, which is just washing your fingertips. 
if you say to your kila, the rabbi of the kila says, from now on, no more mayim achonim. He's not saying, from now on, you're allowed to eat pig. He's not saying, from now on, you're allowed to marry men with men. He's not saying that. Something small that most of us wouldn't even, wouldn't even remember. Suddenly he says, from now on, no more mayim achonim. Or anything else that people think is small. He says, Rabbi Yitzchak Ama says, making the smallest sin, smallest sin into something permissible is worse, a thousand times worse than somebody making the biggest sin in the Torah by himself. Let's call it Shabbat. If they said, for example, you're not allowed to do such and such. Something small, tiny. And the rabbi says, no, you know what? From now on, you're allowed. And it's not allowed. But he says it's allowed. Something tiny. That tiny change in the Torah, that change is a thousand times worse than driving on Shabbat while eating pork. A thousand times worse. That tiny change. And he continues, Rabbeinu Yitzchak HaRamaz says, Umi shelo mevin et adavar hazeh, en lo tchilat ha-yedi'a ba'avanat ha-torat ha-elokim. And whoever does not understand the specific issue, does not even have the beginning of the understanding of the Torah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you don't understand that changing the Torah even on the smallest thing, on a microscopic thing, and making the smallest sin into something permissible, that's not a thousand times worse than somebody making the worst sin in the Torah by himself. You don't understand that that's worse. You don't have any concept whatsoever of what Torah Tashem is. You have no idea what it is. To you, it might as well be a history book. Yeah, but I went to Yeshiva for 20 years. You wasted your parents' money. You have no concept of what Torah is. So now Rav Shlomo Amar says, this is exactly why HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the world at Dora Mabul. It wasn't homosexuality per se that destroyed the world. The Zohar Kadosh says there was stealing. That was the last sin that pretty much took everything over the uh, top for Hashem. There was stealing. There were murdering. They were doing every sin. But what was the thing that was most filthy and disgusting for Hashem? When they made marriage between men and men, a mitzvah. Where they would put a ketubah on it. Which unfortunately, Rabotai Karim is happening right now. As we speak, there are certain people that call themselves religious orthodox that are saying it's okay to marry men with men. Hashem Yerachem. It's happening as we speak. This is why Kadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the world. Rav Shlomo Amar says, we are in the 50th level as we speak. Now where did these people start? You think these people started first sin they ever made in the Torah is homosexuality? Does anybody really think that? They went for the home run on day one? Starts different. 60 years ago, 70 years ago, if you looked at the world at that time, and the world jewelry at that time, and you looked at the conservative Jews, conservative Jews at that time, you wouldn't find much of a difference between the conservative Jews of 70 years ago and many of the Orthodox of Jews of today. What happened about 60 years ago? They made a rule that they wanted to Im- increase the number of people in their kila. Unity. In the name of unity, what do they do? You're allowed to drive to Bet Knesset on Shabbat. They figured that if they bring more people that are far away, that are not going to go to shul because you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat, but they're going to make something minor, in their mind, minor, allowed. You're allowed to drive on Shabbat to be Knesset. That will increase the size of the kila. 
that will increase the bank account of the kila also. We can build a bigger institution, so on and so forth, get the people to come to move closer because we're doing kiruv, doing kiruv by telling people to drive on Shabbat, kiruv, and that will improve Judaism, right? They come to Shul. Well, 60 years fast forward, the head rabbi of the conservative movement is openly homosexual. Head rabbi in Yerushalayim. The difference between conservative and reform today is almost zero. They both accept intermarriage. They both officiate into marriage. The only major difference between reform and conservative is that the reform, many of their people, including their rabbis, are not even Jewish. Bechlal. Like, it's some Chinese woman from China. Never converted to anything. But she decides she wants to be a rabbi. It's a career. No! There is. I'm, I'm dead serious. It's real stories. I'm not making this stuff up. As, 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 as sad as it sounds, it's true. The conservative is still keeping to some extent. They haven't let the Goy be the rabbi yet, at least not to my knowledge, and they haven't done bar mitzvah to dogs yet, which the reform already have beat them to that. But as far as Torah, both of them abandoned the Torah by the oral Torah completely. Where did it start from? A small minor infraction or improvement, if you will, in their mind of the Torah. Now, for all of us here in Florida, in New York, in America, in Israel that feel safe because we call ourselves Orthodox, we also know that in reality there are different shades of Orthodox. People give it different names. Modern Orthodox, Haredi, this, that. Everybody's got different shades and colors. Kippah Suga, you know, knitted Kippah, black Kippah, all this stuff. Tachlis is, do you keep or you don't keep? Now, here's a problem. In America and Israel, there is this problem called modern orthodoxy. Why, is it, why do I call it a problem? Is because the parents don't understand what it means to repeat the same mistakes as their grandparents and change the Torah a little bit. So if you notice, modern orthodoxy, modesty almost doesn't exist. Modesty, for many of the members of the people of modern orthodoxy, modesty almost doesn't exist. To such an extent that all of those girls that I was telling you about, there was the commercial, the commercial I told you about before, that the little Vadya said that's commercial, close your eyes, all of them were, were, were modern orthodox. Every single one of them. Their parents that looked worse than them, that were right behind them, it was a worse commercial, also modern Orthodox. It says Shabbat Shalom, good Shabbos. You walk around a Jewish neighborhood on Shabbat, you're going to see a bunch of people that keep Shabbat. But you don't know that until they start saying Shabbat Shalom or good Shabbos. Why? Because you can't tell the difference based on their looks between them and the Goyim. can't tell the difference. Between them and the Chilonim, you cannot tell the difference. Kisui Rosh almost doesn't exist. And if it does, it's usually a wig that's longer than the exile. You ask the woman, how come your wig is so long but your skirt is so short? If it was the opposite, maybe it would be kasher. Long skirt, short wig, maybe you could find some leniency if it's not from Abu Dazara. I don't know. But your wig is long, your skirt is short. What happened? No, no, we're modern Orthodox. We're modern Orthodox. How come, you guys, how come, how come you're not wearing tzitzit? How come you don't wear tzitzit? How come you don't wear tzitzit? No, no, it's hot. It's Florida, it's hot. I'm not an Orthodox. As long as I'm not wearing a clothing with four corners, you don't have to wear tzitzit, right, Rabbi? I'm not an Orthodox. Kabbalah Masechet Menachot says the first people are going to be punished at the time of Mashiach are people who don't wear tzitzit. I'm not an Orthodox. I'm not an Orthodox. Why? You were so arrogant of all of your other mitzvot that you gave up on a mitzvah you can make every second. You asked them, how come uh, Mr. Uh, religious, 
How come you don't watch your eyes and every woman that walks by you, you look at her even though your wife is right next to you? How come? How come you don't watch your eyes? You know, there's a verse in the Torah, you say Kriyat Shema twice a day. Don't follow your eyes, don't follow your heart. How come you look, your, your heart and your eyes are already your next door neighbor? They might as well pay rent. How come? How come they're over there so much? Your wife is right next to you. Have some kavod for your wife. Akadosh Bochu is everywhere. <laughs> He's everywhere. You have no kavod. You're looking at everything. How come? No, no, we're modern Orthodox. Modern Orthodox. So they tell you, they have a tshuva for everything. We're modern Orthodox. No tzitzit, modern Orthodox. No kisurosh, modern Orthodox. Short sleeve for a woman, no modern Orthodox. Short everything, modern, everything is modern Orthodox. Have you noticed something? Before the Orthodox comes the modern. Meaning before your Haredi, before your Orthodox, which in essence is Haredi, comes the modern. Meaning that when you're modern Orthodox, what's really Orthodox about you? The modernism. The modernism is the Orthodox. The issue that a person, when a person says he's Haredi Moderni, is Orthodox but modern. What does it mean? His zealousness, his Avodat Hashem, his everything is being given to modernism. Every day he reviews himself. She reviews himself. How could I look more like the Green? I don't want to look like these Haridim. They cover their head with a mitpachat. She looks like Sarai Menu. Sarai Menu is already 4,000 years old. Who wants to look like a 4,000 year old woman? Nah, she has a kisurah. I want to cover my head. Oh, he looks like he has a suit on. Nah, I'm going to wear extra tight. He wants to get his, uh, his, uh, his, his suit from a designer name, extra tight, so you could see every rib in his body. She wants to get all the clothes that fit tight, so you could see every figure and every move that she has. In the name of modernism, every day she's constantly, he's constantly measuring himself, not against Moshe Rabbeinu, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He's not measuring himself against Rav Kanievsky, Arav Ovadia. These are not his role models. Who are his role models? Who are his role models? The Goim. So when he mentions something, even in a shiur, if he's a rabbi, or he's a speaker, what is he going to mention to you as the source for his, for his chokhmah, for his wisdom? He's going to w- mention the goyim. Sun Tzu, he's going to mention uh, the, the, that uh, Noef, what's his name? The big giant guy. Uh, Tim Robbins, uh, Tony Robbins. Womanizer that he is. He's the role model. He's not going to mention the Rambam. He's going to mention the Rambam next to Tony Robbins. Like, as if they're on the same level. Why? Because in his mind, Esav and Yaakov are battling constantly. In her mind, Esav and Yaakov are constantly battling. She wants to go to Shul Torah, but as long as you don't tell her that she has to be modest. She wants to go to Shul Torah, it's going to give her chizuk to continue her life as is. It's going to give her chizuk to continue walking around like some person had never heard Torah in their life. It's going to give a chizuk that she's going to have miracles in her life. He's going to have miracles on his life as long as they say this one specific teilim once a month, but no matter the fact that she's violating the entire Torah every second she exists. Someone sent me a video today and showed me how a person can manipulate even something holy. A holy rabbi made a shiul, said... This month is a skula, Rosh Chodesh Kislev. If a person does not complain about Hashem the entire month, which is very, very difficult, doesn't only mean you have to be righteous, but you have to be righteous at a very high level. The uh, Chachamim, I think it was the uh, uh, one of the Mekubalim in, uh, in uh, Sfaradim, says that if you do this, you get a miracle. Get miracles in your life. You don't complain about Hashem for a month. In reality, if you do this all year, you're going to get miracles. Don't complain about Hashem. You only think Hashem. You get miracles all year. But nonetheless, there's a special, auspicious month to get miracles if you don't complain against Hashem. So one woman 
sends us to another one of my students. She says, see, you don't have to do what Hashem says. Doesn't matter if I'm modest or not modest. As long as I don't complain against Hashem, I'm going to get miracles this month. I said, Rachmana litzlan from such people. How they manipulate something holy to fit their cheshbon, their whole accounting, and how and who and what, just so they don't have to do tshuva. Problem is, Rabotai, conservative used to be no different than modern orthodox. The grandkids of the seven years ago today are marrying men with men. Even though the father today can say that it's not a big deal if you're not modest. It's not a big deal if you don't wear a tzitzit. It's not a big deal if you don't cover your head. It's not a big deal if you drive on Shabbat. The certain modern Orthodox shuls here in Florida that I know of, they literally have two, three hundred cars driving in on Shabbat and driving out on Shabbat. Because they're modern Orthodox and it's not such a big deal. And you're not allowed to rebuke in this generation apparently. The reality is, Rabotai, the parent acts like this, completely destroys the Torah, thinking that their kid will at least be okay. Because he's modern Orthodox. The kid throws out the Orthodox, just keeps the modern. Shows up at the house, Abba, listen, I'm, uh, this Torah stuff is not really for me. I'm more modern. I'm going to go be a computer programmer. I'm going to make an app. I'm going to go design some uh, new, uh, new software. Okay, great. No problem. You're allowed to make money. You like to make a living. Where are you going to live? Oh, I'm going to live in San Francisco with all the homosexuals. Where even, even the animals in San Francisco, real study was done, the animals in San Francisco have the highest level of homosexuality in the world. Meaning the tum'ah of the people has affected the animals. I'm not sure if Tel Aviv has a zoo, but if it doesn't, it's definitely going to beat San Francisco. Because it's become the capital of homosexuality in the world. Rahman Ali Tzlan, our own home country. So the son says, Abba, I'm going to San Francisco. And what about the grandson? Grandson's just an outright animal. He has no concept whatsoever of what Kedusha is, what Tara is. He marries a non-Jew. She marries a non-Jew. She has no concept and no care in the world of her grandfather's modern orthodoxy. And that's why en baich, en baich, en bomet. Chachamim say, when we do not keep strict, keep the law of HaKadosh Baruch strict, every house will be affected. Every house. Now, just to give you guys a little bit of food for thought of what the tzaddikim did in order to keep their kedusha. The stipler gaon. Of Kanievsky's father and Ruch HaKodesh. But you don't get Ruch HaKodesh just by learning books. You get the Ruch HaKodesh by also having Midot that match the books. One time he saw that his daughters were going to go to school, but the uniform that they had in the school wasn't modest enough to his criteria. She said, One second, he took his coat. And he cut it, cut the bottom of the coat, and he put it on their sleeves, on his daughter's sleeves. Sewed it on, he goes, okay, now you can go. And the daughter says, uh, but, uh, but Abba, we're going to look strange. We're going to look strange next to everybody else that we have these. Uh... Step of going says, what's so strange? It's strange all of them are strange that they have a Torah that says you have to be modest and they choose not to be modest. That they give you a shirt that's so tight on you. They're the strange ones. You're the normal one. You're the normal one. They're strange that they will have a Torah. They have a rule book from a Torah and they're going to violate it. They're strange. That's a holy person. A holy person thinks like this. Rabbi Ephraim says that when you keep the Torah, even though there are many, many people that are doing the opposite of you, you keep Shabbat, they drive on Shabbat. You keep kosher, they eat taref. You do everything that a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, and your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your friend, everybody else is doing the opposite. 
So it's hard sometimes. Why? Because it looks like it's fun. You went to the shul on Shabbat, they went to the game. And when they come back, they tell you a bunch of stories of what happened at the game. Oh, he shot him, and he beat him, and he did this, and he did that, and I met this girl, and we hung out. And they make you jealous of their Yetzirah fulfillment that they did. And you're not coming back from shul, says, oh, and the rabbi said this, and the rabbi said that. You're not saying that. What are you saying? You're saying, oh, Baruch Hashem, Shabbat Shalom. That's the, the highlight of Shabbat. That's the highlight of Shabbat. Okay, there's maybe a shul, got a little excited, but no one's coming home with excitement like he came from a game. So it sounds like it's more fun to be at the game. Always remember, you are the Mekor Israel. If you are fulfilling the Torah, you are the true descendants of Israel, and for you the world exists. They, until they do tshuva, are simply a fake version. There's the real bag that costs $2,000, and then there's the fake one for $15 in Chinatown. They both look the same, but everybody knows the real one is the real deal. Everyone knows. If you tell a woman, listen, let's say money is not an issue. Which bag do you want? The $3,000 Louis Vuitton that's really coming from the store, or the one we got from Chinatown that's $13? Which one do you want for your birthday? Money is not an issue. Not a single woman on earth will say, I want a $13 fake. Not because of the look. Because they're so good today, you can't tell the difference. Not because of the look. No one wants to have a fake. No one wants to be fake. Even the ones that walk around with a fake. Don't tell anybody. Oh, by the way, you see my fake bag? No one does that. Yeah, I just got it from Chinatown, $13. Ha <laughs> you pay $13,000 for yours. No one does that. When your girlfriend say to you, wow, it's a nice bag, where'd you get it? It's your birthday? Yeah, yeah, my birthday. <laughs> birthday. Tisha B'Av, maybe. $13 in Chinatown. But you're not going to tell her that. Why? Because you have to think it's real. Until you can afford the real one. Point being is, Rabbi Tayy Karim, when you keep Torah and mitzvot, it doesn't matter that they're more numerous than you that are violating the Torah. You are the real version. You are what the Torah says. You are the Mekor Israel. What's the biggest proof that a person can verify and validate that they are Mekor Israel? By fulfilling the mitzvah of Kiruv. By fulfilling the mitzvah of helping other Jews do tshuva. Why? Because we learned from the Rajba the only reason why the Erev Rav was saved was because of the power of Mikor Israel, of Yaakov, the Kedusha of Yaakov. When you do Kiruv, whether it's donating money, or it's giving out CDs, or it's sharing the Shur or others that we do, when you bring people to the lecture, you try to get other people that are not necessarily on the right path. They're like a little fake, a little Esav, a little Yaakov. They want to be Yaakov, but they're doing a bunch of stuff Esav does. When you try to bring them and you do everything possible to bring Kedusha to their life, you're validating for sure that you are Mikor Israel. Why? Because the power of your Kedusha can change them even if they're Erev Rav himself. Even if they're Erev Rav. This is why each one of us should never ever give up on doing Kiruv. There are some people you need to give up on. If they're anti-Torah, to such an extent that they make fun of it. It's better you give up on them, because in essence, every time you come to them, they make more sins. Go find somebody else. Even though it's not your, that somebody else is not your brother, or your cousin, or your loved one, try to help other people do tshuva. You don't have anybody that you want to help do tshuva? Donate. Take the money that you work so hard for, and give it to its kiruv. We'll help them do tshuva. All of these shiurim are free, but they cost money. The point being, Rabotai, the way to validate that we are Mikor Israel, that we are Yaakov, is by helping other people take part of the Kedusha. This is the biggest difference between someone that's Mikor Israel and someone that's simply Esav. Now, unfortunately, Esav and Erev Rav don't just sit there quietly while Yaakov does Kiruv. 
some of Esav's descendants are very strong, evil people. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the most loved Jewish people that's lived in the last hundred years is Rav Mordechai Eliyahu. This is a person that was a Ish Kodesh, huge Tamit Chacham, and loved Am Yisrael in a very high level. Anyone that saw the video that we publicized today where Frum scientist, who himself is a Baal Tshuva, did research on the aura of people. You know, aura, everyone knows, is a real thing. And, but he did something different, something unique from what other people do. Other people that use this machine to, uh, to uh, see what the aura is of a certain person, they see what your status is, what changes you, what doesn't change you, if you're doing this, if you're doing that. This Jew, this Frum Jew, did something unique with this machine. He analyzed what the aura of a Jew looks like while he's fulfilling mitzvot and when he's not. And it's amazing how the colors change where it looks like when a person does a mitzvah, he literally becomes like a malach Hashem, becomes like an angel. White or purple. When not doing so much, yellow, that's the standard. Doing something bad, like for example, wearing a tefillin, that's pasul, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, not a kosher pair of tefillin, it becomes dark, as if you're making a sin. Wear a kosher tefillin, become purple like a purple crown on top of your head. You see the video, it's on our website, on our uh, YouTube page, we publicized it today, it's like six minutes. Interestingly enough, he also covered Kisui Rosh. He said when a woman covers her head with a mitpachat, it's like a man wears tefillin. Woman doesn't cover her head, it's like yellow standard. Woman covers her head with a wig, it's like bad tefillin, Shem Yachem. It's like unkosher tefillin, he says. He goes, I don't know. He says himself, I don't know what's in these wigs, but every time we checked a woman wearing a wig, it was like the same results that we got when a guy was wearing tefillin that was not kosher, where the, uh, the uh, cloth was uh, taken out. As if it was worse to wear the wig than to not cover her hair as, at all. This doesn't mean that you don't cover your head, it's a mitzvah. You're still making an avirah if you're a married woman and you have a head, you have to cover your head. If you don't have a head or you're not married, you don't have to cover your head. But as long as you have a head and you're married, you have to cover your head with a mitpachat. Sometimes we forget our head, but we still have one though. It's attached. Don't, go home with, don't uh, leave home without it. Now, one of the interesting things he had in the video is he had a video of Rav Mordechai Eliyahu. Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, he takes a video of him. Naturally, he looks like, naturally, without anything, he looks already like somebody that's wearing tefillin, purple. When he put a talit on, just talit, not tefillin, just talit, he looks like white. Something that most of us probably can't even reach. Even if we put on tefillin, two of them. That's how holy he was. So, and this is scientific research. Believe, don't believe, that's your, that's your business. It's funny how anytime science proves that the lie is real, no one wants to believe it. Anytime science looks like it's contradicting the Torah, it's because science is wrong, but that's a different story. And, oh, see, science said, science said, science. All of a sudden, everybody became a scientist. They don't even know how to spell science, but they're scientists. So now, Arab Mordechai Eliyahu, one time they invited him to do a series of lectures, an all-day marathon, from the morning to night. And he was the head rabbi of Israel at the time, Rishon Letzion. And they had, go to this place in the north, an hour and a half lecture, half hour to the next place, an hour and a half lecture, 15 minutes to the next place, an hour and a half lecture, from morning to night, one lecture after another. He was already older, but for Torah, no problem. They arrive at the first location. They see that his big posters have been torn off and replaced with another poster Rav Mordechai Eliyahu is sick. Sure, canceled. He's not sick. He has no idea who said he's sick. They go to the door with all the people. They go to the door. Locked. They find the Gabai of the Beknesset. Oh, for the Rav, I thought it was canceled. Uh, you're sick. He goes, no, I'm not sick. Baruch Hashem, not sick. 
Can you open the place? He goes, yeah, but I don't think anyone's going to come. Maybe someone's going to come. He goes into the place, wait for an hour and a half, not a single person shows up. Okay, let's go to the next location. They go to the next location, same exact thing happens. The poster is down, replaced by a different poster, Ramo de Chayeliyahu, is sick, she or canceled. Now this is a nice poster, they put a lot of money into this. She or canceled. Again, they wait an hour and a half, nobody shows up. The next place they go to, same exact thing happens. Meaning this Rasha Merusha, this Erev Rav Amalek, invested time, money, resources, and everything to destroy one shoe after another. The people that were helping Gamod HaEliyah were so upset, they couldn't believe somebody would do such a thing. In Eretz Yisrael, we're not in, a, uh, in, some, in, in the UK with Mirvis. We're here in Eretz Yisrael, what's going on? One shoe after another, one after another, three, four, five. Everything is cancelled. It's obviously st- the whole thing is a system. Some Rasha did all of this. Why don't we just, why do we call the day? He goes, no, no, no. We already made a schedule. Maybe somebody's waiting for us at that time. One place. The whole day was one after another. He goes to every place, waits there for an hour and a half. Nobody shows up. They leave. He doesn't leave as soon as he sees nobody's there. Sits there. Nobody's there. Okay, nobody's there. What can we do? We leave. You know, upset a little bit that, you know, you didn't do Kirub like you wanted to do. You didn't give Chizuk to the nation like you wanted to do. But what can you do? Be on your hands. That's the will of Hashem. <coughs> One place they arrive to, a woman arrives. And she sees there's nobody there. And then the rabbi arrives. He goes, oh, okay. It's Boch Hashem. Somebody goes, oh, I saw that there's a poster right there. She was Kenzo. You don't feel well, Kodav? He goes, no, no, no. I feel well. We can do a shoe. You could be in a shoe. An hour and a half he gives this woman a shoe. But he gives a shoe as if there's 5,000 people there. Just missing 4,999. That's it. He gives the shoe with all the passion and everything. Like, there's nothing wrong. They complete the day. One person the whole day. It's supposed to be tens of thousands of people. At the end of the day, all the helpers are really, really upset. But there's nothing you can do. Who is this Amalek that did all of this? No one knows. Who is this Rashad that manipulated and did all this? No one knows. But that's the will of Hashem. Ram Yao goes back home, goes back to the Sfarim, and like as if nothing happened. Well, he knows whatever happened, HaKadosh Baruch allowed it to happen. Years passed. Many years passed. And one day they get a call at his office and they say, the guy, respectable guy, says, I want to meet with the Kvodah Rav. So, he comes, meet with the rabbi, respectable religious guy, sits with the rabbi, says, Kvodah Rav, I want to let you know that uh, you influenced my life. He says, who are you? He says, many years ago, you had a series of shurim that someone ruined for you, put signs in every place. And you didn't have any shuim except there was one shu that you had one woman. He goes, yeah. He goes, I was one of the bodyguards that was hired for the day. He was a Rishon Litzion, has to have some people to protect him from the crowds and so on. I was one of the bodyguards that was hired for that day. I was a young kid. And I was hired to, to watch out for you. But I wasn't religious. I just was hired for my job. But I saw how this old man keeps going to one place after another, another place, another place, and there's nobody there. But you keep trying. And you keep going to another place, and you never slow down. You never lose steam. And I said, what is he fighting for? Why does he care so much? What does he have that's so valuable that he's willing to put everything on a line just to share it with even a single woman that he doesn't even know? I must look into this. Whatever this guy has, whatever this old man has, and I looked in the Torah, I looked in the Torah, I found the truth, I did tshuva, I married a kosher woman, I had Baruch Hashem kids, I started uh, teaching Torah, started doing kiruv, helped a bunch of people do tshuva. Mordechai Eliyahu says to his Gabbai, look at what happened and we didn't even say a word. Imagine they let us speak. 
Imagine they let us speak. When a person means well, he means to bring Kedusha to the world, even something that seems simple, just his action, just him going to the store, just him wearing a kippah, just him wearing a tzitzi, just him doing a favor for someone, opening the door, being kind, doing business, his day-to-day behavior will help people do tshuva. Needless to say, if he actually tries to do more than that, that's the difference between someone that's Yaakov, that's Mekor Israel, versus Esav. This Rabotai Karim is something that we are all capable of doing. We're all capable of sharing Kedusha around the world. All you got to want to do is, number one, you be authentic yourself. Don't be a faker. Don't be one of these modern people that cuts a new mitzvah that doesn't fit your life or your desires every other day. And don't ever think that the secular person has a better life than you. That's a mistake. That's a very big mistake. People think that secular people have a better life. That's a very serious mistake that they have. Why do they think this? Because they see these people coming back from the game, coming back from the sports, coming back from all types of things, and they, it looks like they're having fun. Sometimes the Avrech, a person that learns Torah all day, all night, he makes the mistake of thinking that some of his family members are having a better time than him because they're not religious. To show the truth, all you got to do is wait a little bit. Wait a little bit and then see what unfolds eventually. What unfolds eventually? Baruch Hashem, I'm older than most of you. And I can tell you, I used to admire really, really rich people. Although I was rich, Baruch Hashem, before Hashem took all that tumah away from me, Baruch Hashem, I admired people that were much richer than me until I learned about their life. I admired people like Warren Buffett, people like Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos. These are people that are on the Forbes 500, multi-billionaires, richest people in the world. Average person in the world today admires them like they're God. Why? Each one is on the Forbes 500. Each one's on the news every other day. Each one has billions and billions of dollars more than you have hair. So you figure this guy is, is admirable. But once you learn about their life, you see how despicable their life really is. Warren Buffett, his own wife left him because he's simply unbearable. Even though he looks like a nice old man that eats a burger for $2 a day, that's his breakfast every single day. He has 80, 100 billion dollars. He doesn't want to spend it though. So he buys $2 McDonald's burger every day. That's his breakfast. He still lives in the same house as he did 50, 60 years ago as he grew up in. He doesn't want to buy a nice house to fit his budget. He doesn't want to spend his money. Thinks he's being wasteful as if he's taking the money to, to, to gain home with him. Relationship with the kids as if they're strangers. And his wife left him. The love of his life left him. Why? Well, he's unbearable as a human being. He's cute like a teddy bear on TV. In reality, who could stand this? Steve Jobs. Everybody admires Steve Jobs. The Apple phone, real genius, and so on and so forth. All these people are geniuses. Doesn't mean they're good people, though. You read his bio. I was on the board of directors of a uh, certain uh, producer that made a film about him. He told us himself. I was really surprised. The most surprising thing about investigating Steve Jobs' life. What was surprising? Everyone that knew him hated him. Everyone agreed he's a genius, but they all hated him. Why? He was simply a rotten human being. Atheist at his core, rotten human being. Jeff Bezos, the current richest man in the world, started Amazon. He has a defense mechanism, a psychological defense mechanism. Every time he's uncomfortable, he has this obnoxious laugh. They make clips about it on TV. How funny the slap is. Anyway, he looks like a really happy guy. $100 billion, why wouldn't you be happy? His wife left him, divorced him. He cheated on her on top of that, if that's not enough. And best of yet, it's a known thing. A known thing, there's a meeting at Amazon every day. Someone walks out of that meeting crying, hysterical like a little baby, because of what Jeff Bezos did to them. How he insulted them and embarrassed them that day. Every day he murders somebody in cold blood. These are the people that Esav admires. 
These are the people Esav admires. Who does Yaakov admire? Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, the Rambam, the Chazonish, the Ben Ishchai. Why? They are the exact opposite of all of that. It doesn't mean that they were all poor. It doesn't mean that they were less successful. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that one had an instruction set from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and one had an instruction set from the Satan himself. What's the instruction set from Satan? Follow your desires. You want a woman? Go look for one in the streets. Wherever you can find one, just get one already. You want food? Go to any place, just eat whatever you can get. You have some type of desire? Fulfill it ASAP before it runs away from you. That's Esav. The difference between Esav and Yaakov, Rabotai, and Karim is not the intellect, it's not the mental prowess, it's not the uh, what family you came from or what family you didn't come from. Because as we already saw, even if your family didn't keep any mitzvot and you came from Nida, you could still be Yaakov. Because the power of tshuva can overcome all the tumah in the world. The major difference between Esav and Yaakov is what you do with your desires. If you try to fulfill every one of your animalistic desires, as if that's why you live in the world, you may succeed monetarily, you may not. But life, for sure you will fail. You will live a life that's a complete failure. But if you fulfill the Torah and the instruction set of the Torah, desire will simply become part of your life. Good will be your entire life. The right direction will be your whole life, your destination. Why? Because you have a guaranteed track record from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the only difference between the two. How you treat your desires. If your life is about fulfilling desires, Unfortunately, you're acting like Esav, even if you were born Yaakov. If your life is about fulfilling what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said you should fulfill, which still means you'll have desires that you'll fulfill, just in a kosher way. You can eat also, but you'll eat kosher food. You can have uh, intimacy also, but with just with your wife when she's after mikveh, and so on and so forth. You, my friend, will live a life of Yaakov and Sarah and Rivka and Leah and Rachel, and you will be in Olam Abba with them as well, in a good place. This Be'ezat Hashem will give each and every one of us that's doing tshuva, that did tshuva, that's trying to do tshuva, a little bit more chizuk and a clear understanding of what's the difference between Esav and Yaakov, but also where you can be. Not where you are. It doesn't matter where you are, but where you can be. All of us have the power to do it. It's simply how we treat our desires. Be'ezat Hashem gives all of us chizuk to do tshuva, to get closer to Hashem, and get further and further away from Esav, while also bringing the ones that are acting like Esav, together with us, to act like Yaakov.